is there the possibility of uh, some of them trying to return to uh, activities that are detrimental to us? Absolutely. This is something that I would do again and I will continue to uh, do wherever I have an opportunity. The president may very well have committed a federal crime by, by uh, um, make, uh, giving material assistance to a terrorist organization. The last time a president was impeached it was a disaster and it was arguably over nonsense. This is far, far more serious. It's a sober-minded argument that many thoughtful people are making. Should President Obama be impeached for his endless abuse of power? For more than five years, conservatives have called for the president's impeachment, but now the debate is resurfacing in light of his illegal Taliban prisoner swap. Well, in his new book called Faithless Execution, former federal prosecutor Andrew McCarthy lays out the case for impeaching the president. He joins us now from New York. Mr. McCarthy, welcome to the show. There's so much I want to talk to you ab about your book. Uh, but let's, before we dig into the laundry list of impeachable offenses, let's talk about the latest that I think came out after your book was written, the illegal swap of one deserting U.S. soldier for five senior Taliban commanders. Tell me a bit about the case of Bo Bergdahl. Well, we have, Ezra, a deserter, as you mentioned, someone uh, who at the very least based on what we know from uh, people who served with him at the time, uh, left his post without authorization. There's also indications that he could have become a collaborator, uh, at least uh, at, at first willfully and then perhaps later uh, unwillingly. Uh, but in any event, he could have become a, a collaborator. That's still got to be uh, investigated uh, with the Taliban. Uh, and in exchange for him, uh, President Obama shockingly has turned over five top commanders of the Taliban, five of their most experienced, most implacably anti-American uh, operatives. So it's a very, very difficult thing. I would say an impossible thing to justify. And it seems to me that given that it was done at a time when we still have men and women in harm's way on the battlefield, on, at a time when the Taliban is still conducting offensive terrorist operations, it's really a shocking dereliction of duty by the commander-in-chief. Yeah, I mean, I'd say there's three levels to it. First of all, the, the ethical level of swapping uh, for convicted terrorists who are unrepentant. Second of all, the practical uh, effect of sending a signal to the world, kidnap an American soldier, and right. you can spring anyone out of jail. Uh, law and order be damned, rule of law be damned. We're not into total victory anymore. But here's the point that goes to your book about impeaching the U.S. president. Is there not a law passed by Congress that to release con Taliban or Al-Qaeda prisoners, it must first serve notice, if not get approval, of the U.S. legislature? In other words, the president can't just uh, give away Taliban terrorists in a, in a midnight poker game. He has to follow a rule of law. Am I correct in that? Well, there is such a law, and as you know, I'm, I'm hardly a great defender of the Obama administration, but I do think they have a point when they say the law is constitutionally suspect. In our law, uh, you can't amend the Constitution with a statute. And if the president has plenary authority over the disposition of enemy combatants, that's not something that the, uh, that's not a commander-in-chief power that Congress could take away from him by a statute. I, I actually think the statute which has gotten a lot of play in Washington, mainly, I think, because the, uh, the Congress's pride is hurt more than anything else. Uh, in the greater scheme of things, uh, it, it's, it's relatively unimportant. I mean, if you want to talk about a statute, he's providing material support to terrorism, which is a, cr a criminal felony under federal law. And more importantly, in terms of dereliction of duty, which is an impeachable offense, the, you have the commander-in-chief replenishing the enemy forces in wartime while the enemy is still attacking us. And in terms of the 30-day, this notification statute that you're referring to, I think far more important than the sus uh, substance of the statute is a year ago, the president, through his spokesman, promised to comply with the statute, whether he thought it was uh, constitutional or not. You don't get to lie to Congress. If the president wants to protest that he thinks a statute is unconstitutional, he can do that, but he's got to be forthright about it. Yeah. So what you're saying is the law, this law which may or may not be constitutional, is the least of it. It's the yes. act itself which is so offensive to uh, the nature of a commander-in-chief in the U.S. Constitution. You're right. I mean, the war with the Taliban is ongoing. There are U.S. troops there by the thousand, 
And I mean, this, I mean, th this would be like uh, midway between the D-Day invasions of Normandy and the surrender uh, in, in Hitler's bunker a year in, uh, later if, if the president of the United States started swapping out senior commanders of the Nazis captured right. for, I mean... You, it's, just, like giving, it's like giving Rommel back. Yeah, just in right. the middle of a war. I mean, after a war, you're making some sort of national peace. Concessions can be made for political reasons. They no longer have military implications. We can bite our tongue and do things like that. But the war is still hot. And let me quote to you uh, from one of the commanders, the Taliban commanders that was released uh, to Qatar. Let's put this, the quote on the screen right now, and I'll, I'll read it to you. I mean, these folks are completely unrepentant. I'm reading a, a Taliban commander from Afghanistan quoted on NBC News. After arriving in Qatar, Nurullah Nuri kept insisting he would go to Afghanistan and fight American forces there. So, I mean, it's not like these folks are reformed. They right. are ready to go and kill again. Yeah, and notice he, he had no fear of saying that in Qatar either, which is yet another aspect of this. You know, the idea that it's okay because... Qatar is going to, or Qatar, however we're pronouncing it these days, is going to watch them for a year. Uh, that country happens to be one of the most uh, pernicious in terms of enabling Islamic supremacism in the world. It's actually let the Taliban set up shop there in the, with a kind of government in waiting. It's also the headquarters of the leading jurist of the Muslim Brotherhood, Sheikh Yusuf Karadawi, the guy who issued a fatwa in 2003, 2004, calling for the killing of American and Western troops in Iraq. So that's how much confidence we can take that Qatar is going to watch them for a year. They're a disgrace. I mean, I was talking about al Qaeda on the show just on Friday, and these are the folks that we call, quote, our allies. These are the folks that produce Al Jazeera. They're going to host the next World Cup in soccer. They are an enemy in my books.